Welcome to Hit Podcast, HIT, Human Resources, Insurance and Technology. I'm your host, Toby Kennedy. As always, we are dropping into your feed on a weekly basis. We come in on Tuesdays with what I hope is a well-curated series of bite-sized, digestible conversations about things going on in the space, right? We're in human resources, we're in business, we're in operations. Can we bring together some of the things that are going on out there, some of those conversations, and put it together in a nice weekly hit? That's our goal here. That's our mission. As always, this week's episode is brought to you by Montage Insurance Solutions. And without any further ado, let's get right into it. I am so insanely excited to have you on. Mr. Brian Cagle. Brian, how are you, sir? Wonderful to see you, Toby. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Great to be seen. Great to have you on. Now, I want to introduce you to the audience. I want to talk a little bit about sort of your background. But I just want to start by saying we have worked together for years now. We know you firsthand and today's content I have seen in long form seminar fashion, and it was so good. I was like, listen, Brian, I know this is a two hour conversation. It is, yeah. And I know I run a 15-ish minute <laughs> podcast, but if you can <laughs> distill down for me the 10 commandments of workers' compensation into a bite-sized digestible episode, that would be amazing. And you, thankfully, have obliged. Well, we'll see. I, I may be talking very fast today, Toby. This might be part one and we'll do a part two. Listen, we go along, we'll go along. Uh, but we will keep this episode to the time limit we have promised uh, all you guys. Brian, really quick before we get into it, do you mind just giving me a quick high level of your background, kind of sure. what brings you to the chair? Absolutely. Well, uh, so I'm a, an employment law attorney here in California and in Texas. And my primary focus is to help businesses. I try to help businesses stay out of trouble through providing advice and counseling work. When they don't listen or if they forget to give me a call and they find themselves embroiled in litigation, I also handle the litigation element of things. So everything from wage and hour disputes to claims of wrongful termination, discrimination, harassment, retaliation. I do primarily focus my practice on employment work, though, because that has really become my niche. It's yeah. become my strength and it's what I know, love, and I I really enjoy educating business owners and HR professionals so that they know where the pitfalls and the perils really lie. Yeah. And we were talking about this a little bit before the mics heated up, but you've been doing this for a long time and had a great following. And then even, you know, you only have 24 hours in the day and yeah. somehow during COVID everything explodes, right? And it's like, oh, I got to, I am, my phone is ringing. Like I am a high demand guy. So A, I'm happy to have you here. And B, Talk to me a little bit about, you know, since COVID, how things have, uh, boy, it's just really taken off. Well, I mean, listen, we're in a completely different world now. And expectations and workers are different than what they were pre-COVID. And businesses, if they're not adapting, they're truly dying. And yeah. they're going the way of the dodo. Yeah. And I can't tell you how many businesses I've had who have basically said, look, we, we always used to do it this way. And what I've told them is, Look, what got you here is not what's going to get you there. I you have to be able to adapt. You have to be able to change. Yep. You have to be ready for the curveballs that life has just simply thrown us in the last three years. The Who Moved My Cheese book is such a ridiculous, short, yep. easy parable, but yep. I find it so applicable so often. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, I think that the truly innovative, the truly creative, the truly outside-the-box thinking companies are the ones that are all of a sudden starting to see, you know, it started as a trickle, then it came to a light flow, and now all of a sudden the floodgates have opened yeah. up for them because they've been, they took advantage of the opportunity that was put before them. Well, speaking of things that you have a deep expertise in and understanding on, and thank you for kind of, uh, you know, giving the audience a little bit of a, an intro to your, you know, really remarkable uh, acumen, what I brought you here today was to talk about what I thought was a really cool encapsulation of an idea. Yeah. Um, so can you sort of tease the topic and dive right in and, and, and get on high and give us that stone tablet and speak to us, sir? Well, you know, the remarkable thing is I'm not a workers' comp attorney per se, right? But a lot of what happens in employment situations crosses over into the workers' comp realm. Yeah. And so what I've really boiled down is what I call the top 10 commandments from an employment perspective that businesses have to be thinking about 
in advance before they're hit with a worker's compensation claim so that they're prepared. They know how to handle it. They've got the policies, the procedures, the mechanism yeah. to handle them in the most efficient is way. Is thou shall not slip, trip, and fall just one commandment? Or I, is that three commandments? No, no, it's not going to be that simple today, unfortunately. We're going to dive into more of the practical and pragmatic. Well, I, that's I wish why I, I bring could, the experts in. I wish I could say thou shalt not slip, trip, and fall. I wish I could. I bet employers wish that too. You could just exactly. wave a wand and have people not do it. Exactly. So, all right, we've got a meatier set of uh, meatier set of advice uh, yeah. for everybody. So let's get into that meat. Certainly. So we're going to start out with commandment number one, which is thou shalt have workers comp insurance, <sighs> period. Let me be very clear. If you have one employee in the state of California or really in any state, you must by law carry workers compensation insurance. For those of the, um, the listeners who are here in California, Labor Code 3700 specifically lays out this obligation and lays out statutory penalties, violations, and how they're handled. And the problem that we run into from a business standpoint is a lot of folks just say, hey, listen, when I grow, I'll put workers comp in place, but right now yeah. I just don't have the revenues. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a small business. Quite candidly, that is a huge hazard area that a lot of employers are just misstepping in all the time. And it could be more than just a fine, right? Well, it's more than just a fine. And in fact, it can even include potential individual liability, yep. meaning that if you've got a business and you've set up an LLC or an S Corp, but you don't carry insurance, they can come back after you individually yeah. for not carrying that insurance. I've even heard threats like, it, it, you can go to jail. There are criminal penalties, although I will tell you that the di district attorneys in the state of California have not been prosecuting sure. these situations by virtue of the fact that they've got bigger fish to fry. But it is a conversation <laughs> about the severity, right? And Absolutely. probably why it's, it's commandment number one. Exactly. And that's why I start there. There you go. Commandment two. Commandment two is thou shalt document everything. First of all, Businesses should be doing much, much better work at documenting really all aspects of employment from the outset when you hire people on and maintaining records all the way through the employment period. But workers' comp is a really unique circumstance because if a document isn't there to back up a perception mm. or what somebody said that they saw at a particular mm -hmm. time when an mm -hmm. accident occurred, then to me, from a legal standpoint, it doesn't exist. Yep. Because when we come down to testimony of the injured worker versus the witnesses, it becomes a he said, she said, and credibility comes into play. But guess what? If you've done a diligent investigation and you've spoken to key witnesses, or heck, if you've got video evidence, then that's all the better. Yep. But at the end of the day, if you're not doing a great job documenting what you've done, making sure you're addressing the issue and showing that you were attempting to resolve it, then you're going to find yourself behind the eight ball and fighting any one of these little battles. I'm picturing someone that maybe cuts their finger on a meat slicer sort of a thing and claims that the guard wasn't there, right? right. You've got HR that's deployed right away at the accident. They interview other people and they have them on record saying, hey, and now you're here, you're in this commissary that you can see the guards on, et cetera. Exactly. All that's documented. So nine months later, 12 months later, it's not a he said, she said, it's but I, I interviewed people on the day. Right. And well, and the beautiful thing, Toby, is, I mean, remember, humans, our memory fades, right? Yes, yes. And that is beautiful. And some Thank of these, God sometimes. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> but workers' comp claims can take months or even years okay. to resolve. And you may not remember what exactly happened, but if there's that written statement that you can put down in front of somebody saying, do you remember I interviewed you on this day and you said X, Y, and Z? Very powerful evidence to help in, in that assistance of that claim. Yep. And then the one other thing I want to just talk about on the documentation, mm -hmm. a lot of employers want to be very creative in uh, their management of claims, right? Oh, we'll just handle this in-house, right? Wink, wink. Exactly. Well, that is a dangerous, dangerous proposition. Yep. But there are certain circumstances where that is both justified and reasonable. Sure. But you sure as heck better document why in the world you're doing that instead of going through a traditional means of what we'll talk about in the later commandment. Would this apply to maybe like some of the first aid style claims where it maybe they are making a in the moment judgment call? Correct. That's primarily what we're talking about, where it wasn't such a severe injury that somebody had to be transported to a, a hospital or a, an urgent care facility, or if it was something that was a minor type, uh, type injury scenario. Yeah. But at the core of this, I will tell you that I've seen a lot of employers take some severe liberties where it goes well beyond yeah. first aid, where they think that they can handle it internally. And not to put words in your mouth, which you are or are not advocating for, but I, I know from a firm standpoint, we're always telling you know our clients, even if it is just first aid, you should still report it. A hundred percent. 
Yes, 100%. It is required, even for first aid that is being rendered, to report this to your workers' comp carrier. If you are not doing it, you better be doggone sure <laughs> that it's not going to turn into something more. I mean, I'll, I'll just give you a quick anecdote on this. I had a client who had an injury, uh, an employee who became injured, just had a small cut on his finger. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem was they, he didn't care for that cut very well. Yep. It turned into sepsis, yep. and he ended up being hospitalized almost two weeks after this event took place. Well, yep. guess what? The origination of the injury was a workplace injury that was never reported. They then came forward two weeks later when this guy was hospitalized and the bills were just ratcheted through the roof. Yep. And they said, hey, this goes back to a claim two weeks ago. And you know what the workers' comp carrier said? Too bad. Na -na -na -boo -boo. You didn't tell us. Yeah. You didn't tell us. Yeah, yeah. It can happen. It can uh, that, happen. That's why we do these things. That's why we have best practices that lead us to commandments, that leads us to That's right. Three. That's right. Number three is thou shalt provide a safe working environment for all employees. Listen, we expect employees to follow our rules and regulations, right? We expect them to work and operate in a safe manner. But if you're not providing a safe yeah. workplace, then the burden's gonna fall upon you. And then we run afoul of a lot more than just workers' comp problems. Then we run into problems with OSHA, yep. right? We run into problems with other claims that may come about that maybe third-party claims come, come into play. So we have to be very careful, very thoughtful about how we approach those type of scenarios and making sure that we have a safe workplace, that if we don't already have somebody who's coming in and doing a risk analysis for us from the outside, I think Montage does this uh, for God part bless of your you for service. The plug. We sure do. Yes. Right. And and so from the foundation of things, if you don't have somebody coming in and looking at things, you won't know what you don't know. Totally. So you bring the person in, you make the changes, and then you make sure that you've got solid, documented policies. Look, we've got an injury illness prevention program. Part of that is heat injuries, sure. right? We have to have both of those policies under the California codes that are required under a Workers' Compensation Act. Yep. And so fundamentally, if we are ahead of the game and we're providing a safe workplace, then we can expect our people to work in a safe manner. You know, and for me, I'm constantly trying to think about like the business of this too. And it's like, listen, yes, you're OSHA, and yet, but from a claim standpoint, you're going to have your XMOC going up, right? And that yes. your experience modification is what your premiums are tied to. So there's even whether or not you care about worker safety from like a, this is the right thing to do standpoint, they've actually right. monetized you caring. Absolutely. And so when you start getting on OSHA's radar and you have a three and 400 X experience modification, you're paying three, four times more than you should for these policies. And those are real dollars, especially real depending dollars. on if you've got a mid-sized to large company. I mean, that could be millions of dollars. And it should go anywhere else, anywhere else exactly. besides to extra work comp because you couldn't be bothered to get your safety on point. Precisely. Oh, man. Precisely. Okay. All right. Take us to point four, sir. Uh, thou shalt not retaliate against uh. injured workers. And unfortunately, we see a lot of this right? Um, this is primarily that comes into employment related claims rather than workers comp claims. We see what labor code 132A, adverse employment actions. Mm -hmm. We see serious and willful activities such as, you know, we didn't, you didn't provide a safe working environment. Somebody got injured and then you turned around and terminated them as a result. Didn't California expand retaliation also to now it's like presumed that you're, if you do anything, it's retaliation. California changed its rule in 2021 to oh, create the presumption <laughs> of a retaliatory act if someone who had recently made a, a workers' compensation claim suffers any adverse employment action. And adverse employment actions, guys, isn't just termination. Right. It's not just a demotion. You need to maintain benefits for at least 12 weeks while they are on this period of, of leave or if they are in reduced schedule or light duty. And a lot of times people come back and they retaliate and they basically say, look, we'll let you be a janitor for a couple of weeks and not do your normal job, but you're not going to get employee benefits, medical, dental, sure. vision. Well, that's an adverse employment action right there and it oh. creates new litigation. That again, now it's like, it's presumed that was why you did this. That's exactly right. So we're shifting responsibility as far as from a legal standpoint, what you do or don't have to prove. Well, and and it is a it is a major shift from where we were before, where it was more of a net neutral, yeah. right? The plaintiff still had to prove by a, a preponderance of the evidence that there was something done in response is to them taking- 50% in a feather? Is that what you guys say? 50% in a feather. You got it. <laughs> That's right. You got it. Good. See, you should have gone to law school. No, 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 no. <laughs> I interviewed the smart people here. So uh, what's next on the list. Uh, so we've got number five, which is thou shalt show patience. Yeah. When an employee is on leave, let them be on leave. Don't interrupt them. 
Okay, don't force them back to work. If you if they come back with restrictions or limitations, try to provide light or modified duty whenever possible, yep. but don't force them back into a situation where they could exacerbate their injury, get a new injury, or further expand the need for them to take a full leave. Yep. So be patient, let them return to work on their time, rely upon the doctors. But here's the one thing I wanna trigger for a lot of employers out there. It's okay for you to ask for doctor's notes yeah. on a regular basis. Employers think that once somebody's out on workers comp, they don't have to even talk to the person, they don't have to interact with them. That's not true. The law specifically says that we have to engage with employees, that we have to continue communicating with them, and part of that is their burden yep. to get documentation yep. to show that they need to continue to stay out. Yeah, yeah, right on. I love that, thank you. And and, and that's a cool part about bringing you in here is telling the employers, hey, look, there's a couple places you could run afoul, but there's a couple places you have a little empowerment that you should seize too. That's exactly right. And so moving along to commandment number six, this is one of my favorites, which is thou shalt communicate with your adjuster and your broker. Uh, all too often, employers think that they're just going to handle it in-house. They're right. just going to be, they'll do everything that they need to do. They'll tender it to the insurance company. They'll deal directly with the adjuster. And then guess what? Radio silence. And they don't do anything to follow up. Mm -hmm. If you've got your, if you have an insurance broker, mm -hmm. you should use your broker, mm -hmm. leverage your broker to help you because they will help stay in communication back and forth with yes. the adjuster yep. so that these claims can be managed quickly yep. and efficiently, right? Because yep. you want to close these claims as quickly as you possibly with can. Reserve set appropriately. That's exactly yep. right. And your broker will advocate for you, the business owner, while at the same time, they know how to navigate the internal workings and the systems of the carriers themselves, and they can help you help yourself in those situations. Exactly right. And the one thing I will say about this is employers just need to be consistent with their communication. Mm -hmm. Consistency and brevity. Keep it brief, Amen. keep it short, yep. keep it direct. Hey, what's the current status? Give me an update. You know, When's the next doctor's appointment? Do we have a hearing set? Those type of things. If the more you have the communication on a consistent basis, it becomes part of your regular practice, it'll make it a lot easier for all parties involved. Love it. Love it. All right, keep going. All right, number seven, thou shalt maintain an injury illness prevention program. The old IIPP. You got it. And we talked about this earlier when we talked about document, document, yeah. document. Yep. But really, the core elements of an IIPP need to be reviewed on an annual basis. Are you actually enforcing what your injury policies are? Right. What happens if somebody is out in the field and they get injured? Where are they transported? Who is transporting them? Mm -hmm. Who is responsible? And then making sure that your management team, your leadership, your supervisors, your lead men, know the policy inside, outside, upside down, mm -hmm. so that in the event of an emergency, when people are frantic and frenetically running around, you're gonna have somebody on site who knows what to do. They're going to know how to respond and they're going to be able to take action and enforce and, and use that IIPP for the betterment of your employees. Totally. And like you said, reviewing on an annual basis, if for no other reason, maybe you've changed your insurer, maybe the medical clinic, right? The, the network. It, there's so many things that you want to make sure supervisors aren't reaching out to the wrong carrier or network or, or the various things that could change over time let alone changes in best practices and, and some of the reasons why you really want to review that IAPP as regularly as possible. That's exactly right. What's next? All right, number eight, yep. thou shalt not presume that a claim is fraudulent. Okay. All too often. Yeah. I, I just handled the call earlier this morning where the client calls me up and he goes, this guy's claiming workers' comp and I think it's fraudulent. Well, it just happened today and you don't know anything yet, so let's not presume that it's fraudulent. In California, less than 2% of claims are actually prosecuted as fraudulent workers' compensation claims. And that number is a very, very low number in the grand scheme of the volume of workers' comp claims that are filed every year. And so you need to basically treat each injury as being serious, yeah. truthful, and reasonable yep. until you do your investigation. And then if you've got the evidence and you've got the documentation, heck, if you've got the video evidence mm -hmm. to show that it is a fraudulent type situation, you turn that over to the adjuster. You make sure that they have that information clearly, concisely, 
quickly so that they can do what they need to do, which may include a Sabrosa investigation, mm -hmm. basically undercover, yeah. where they go out to find out if this person is malingering or faking their injuries. Yep. And those type of claims do eventually sometimes I thought get you couldn't walk, up. Bill. You played 18 holes yesterday. That's precisely right. Or you're carrying the 80-pound bag of dog food in from the car, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think also that, you know, when an employee gets the whiff and the smell and the sense that you think it's fraudulent off the bat, that can exacerbate litigation oh, and yeah. problems down the road. It's like you said, if you come into this kind-heartedly and open-mindedly that perhaps something really did happen that was out of everybody's hands, it's probably a better angle to take from start than that kind of like, you know, uh, uh, suspicious kind of headmaster or not thinking you yeah. did your homework. I will tell you more times than not, I've been able to counsel employers to be overly generous, yes. I'll say. Mm -hmm in order to avoid that risk of litigation. Right. Because I'll tell you, the moment that that employee gets any kind of feeling- Us first that then type of a yep, thing. Yep. They'll go right over and find a bus bench attorney to help file a worker's compensation claim. <laughs> and then it's gonna sir. turn into a much bigger problem for your business yes. down the road and much yes. more expensive for your carrier and for you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you uh, what's it, you catch more uh, bees with sugar than vinegar or whatever the expression That's is. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. That's yeah. exactly right. Cool. Yeah, and being nice, it, it's free. It is. It is free. And, and again, a lot of businesses are in this idea or mindset of, I only want to provide what I have to provide. Right, right, right. And, and I truly think that that's not a great business model. And it will more times than not backfire yep. on the employer. Yeah. Yeah. No, these are all, these are amazing. I'm loving yeah. every second of this. All right, take me to the next commandment. All right, commandment number nine, we've got thou shalt return an employee to duties, whether regular or modified when possible. That means if somebody comes back and they've got a doctor's note that says that they can't lift 50 pounds, well, let's find a, a job where they can lift 40 or 45 pounds, right? Yeah. Keep them under those modified job restrictions and obligations. It sounds really simple, but I'll be very honest with you. A lot of employers kind of default to the, well, as long as you have any restrictions or or limitations, I can't bring you back to work. Mm, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. is not permissible under California law. Yeah. You have an affirmative duty to engage in the interactive process. You have an affirmative duty to provide a reasonable accommodation. Both of those yeah. are under the Fair Employment and Housing Act. Yep. Employment laws, not workers' comp laws. Yep. And so if we're not doing the best we can to bring that person back to work, then you are really putting yourself into harm's way for a potential employment claim in addition to that workers' compensation claim. Yep. Yep, you're, you're adding insult to injury, part right. of the pun. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. You, yeah. you truly are. And being proactive and being communicative and basically getting out in front of it and saying, look, I'm reaching out to you. You just have to, you have to communicate right. with me, employee. Yeah. And then you make sure, again, you document all of the communications. Are there cases where it is reasonable that they couldn't accommodate? Because I hear the same thing a lot where it's like, I just couldn't do it. And in my head, I think the same thing you're thinking, which is like, I'm not going to push back too hard on this employer saying this, but I bet if you thought a little harder, there's something they can do. But I mean, talk to me about like frequency where you see genuinely that there's, there's no way I could have accommodated. Okay. So first of all, the question that you should be asking whenever somebody tells you that they can't accommodate under any circumstance yeah. because of X, Y, and Z, you say, why? Right. Why? Explain to me why your business is so inflexible that you have nothing to provide, that you couldn't lift a certain burden. You couldn't provide an assistant, you know, for somebody who works in a warehouse, for instance. Right. We deal with this all the time. No lifting over 10 pounds. Well, you know, we have a lot of, we have a lot of packages that are over 10 pounds. Yeah, but you have a lot of packages that are under 10 pounds. Right. Why can't they just do the light duty assignments yeah. and then you have someone else reassigned to handle the heavier stuff? Yeah. And I tell you, you push back just a little bit on employers yeah. and you give them an option. You give them a perspective and they will turn around and they will respond accordingly most of the time. Yeah, that's kind of why I asked the question. Because like I said, you, you do wind up feeling a little bit like, yeah, I'm not just going to take that initial, right. we can't at face value. That's exactly right. push back a little. And like you said, you end up finding something. So. Yep, exactly. Where are we at next? Uh, number 10. Famous number 10, we've got, thou shalt ask questions before taking action. This means calling your broker. This means calling your attorney before you're taking action. Listen, the old adage of an ounce of prevention is mm -hmm. worth more than a pound of cure, mm -hmm. never more true than when it comes to dealing with employment and workers' compensation claims in California. You can pick up the phone and make a 15-minute call to counsel or to your broker and mm -hmm. say, I'm thinking about doing this. Mm -hmm. 
And then they will basically either give you a green light and say, yes, that's the mm -hmm. correct procedure or say, hold on, let's pump the brakes. Let's talk about this a little further because this could be risky. Yeah. Employers don't know what they don't know. Yeah. And the problem that we run into is we have folks out there who are great widget makers, yeah. but they're not great managers of people. There's also a little CYA in this from like an HR standpoint or a business operations standpoint to where we're making these decisions by committee. Yes. I don't want to unilaterally say that I just made this call that later blows up. I want other people weighing in and buying in. So there's some undersigned on this decision. So if I ever get questioned, whatever turns out it wasn't the right thing to do, I can at least start dragging yeah. Brian point, and Toby point the into this. And Brian right. and Toby, That's exactly. Right. <laughs> well, and I tell, I tell clients all the time, I go, look, when you're talking to an employee, blame me. Yeah. Say, say the lawyer yeah. says I have to yeah. do this. And you saw the guy is a jerk. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right on. <laughs> Uh, so that we've covered the Ten Commandments. Those are our right? Ten Commandments. I, I I'm so excited to have been able to boil that down because again, it's it's a multi-hour seminar and you dive so deep. And it, just in case there are folks out there that want to get a hold of you, what's the best way to talk to you about some of this stuff further? Some of the other things you may be an expert in, maybe partnering with you. Sure. I mean, I always welcome opportunities to meet new businesses. Um, like I said, my my passion is to educate. My yeah. passion is to keep people out of problems. Um, so I have been a partner at Green Spoon Martyr for two years now. So you can reach me at uh, 661-550-1450. Or you can just email me. You can look me up on gmlaw.com. And my email and my bio are all there. I'd be happy to work with you. Awesome, man. Thank you so, so much for being on. That is all the time we have for you this week. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Join us next week. Join us every week. And until next week, make this the best week yet.